only God's provision in Jesus Christ could save you because God's holiness demands perfection. Perfection. There could be no sin. There could be no... I, can, I don't even know the smallest smidgen. Like sometimes when Melody Cook said, just put a smidgen of this in it, whatever. That means just a little bit. It could be no speck. And so it came to Jesus, the perfect one, hey? Eh? The perfect one. And in him and through him, we find fellowship, reconciliation, adoption, pardon. We find all of that with God has nothing to do with your effort because of God's holiness because of God's holiness we have to come through Jesus the perfect sinless one and so every time we come here and we share in this bread and this cup we are reminded what could wash away my sin what and what's the answer because God's holiness demands the best. Demands the best. And so, that is what we're going to sing next as we prepare our hearts. Now finally, this moment is for people who could say with all confidence, I accept that Jesus Christ is Lord God I accept his position from everlasting to everlasting. I accept his lordship over my life. Because to participate in this symbol means that you agree, just like we were singing, eh? With all that the symbol represents. And if you can't say that with all assurance in your heart, then let the cup and let the bread pass by and we'll be happy to explain to you how you could have that absolute assurance. That absolute assurance. The only way that you will see God. The only way. We could tell you how that could happen. I'm going to ask Elder Andy Knowles to come up and to break the bread and to dispense the elements this morning and to lead us in prayer for the bread and for the cup because I'm going to go and lead you in the singing of this song what can wash away my sins now the way we do it is when you get the elements when you get the bread and the cup just hold on to it until Elder Knowles comes back and he gives us instruction to eat and drink together.
a good thing that it is nothing but the blood of Jesus. So we don't have to worry about trying to work our way into earning it or doing anything to keep it. Um, so let's just pray and thank God that we could do this in remembrance of him. That's why it's so precious. As we think on him, we think on the fact that his blood saved us for all eternity. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your privilege you've given us to remember this occasion when your blood was shed for us that we might have a new covenant with you and your body was broken that we might have eternal life father we do these things because we want to remember those facts that took place almost two thousand years ago but as we do them today we do them not because we're trying to earn our standing in front of you we're doing them of course of what you've done for us so as we eat this bread and drink this cup may we be thankful in our hearts for your goodness to us for your death on Calvary, that we might know you and we might have eternal life. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's eat together. Amen. We take this time to pause in our service to recognize the, those who are visiting with us this morning. Uh, it is always a pleasure to have uh, folks come in and join us in our worship time. And uh, we want to say a special hello to those who are visiting with us this morning. Uh, I do know we have a, a, a good sized group that's in the middle here and I'm going to invite someone to make a uh, special recognition of them in a little while. Uh, but I want to invite others who are here for the first time or may have not been here in a long time. Those who are visiting here with us at Grace Community Church, if you could please stand so we may say hello. We have a gentleman here. Grace, let's recognize them, please. Beautiful. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Now, Ian and Esther, you all please sit down. Welcome home. I, I, I looked in the parking lot to see if they had a trailer behind their vehicle with all their stuff, meaning that they're moving back to Nassau. But apparently they still ain't moving back yet, Pastor. So it's good to see Ian and Esther. Uh, I think they go back, they move, they go back this week, back to Exuma. So it's good to have you, have you here with us this morning. Um, I saw Debbie there as well, Debbie Allen uh, over there in the corner. Debbie, want to say a special congratulations. You all saw in the papers, uh, the employee of the year for the PHA. So congratulations to you on, on that wonderful achievement. I'm going to invite Pastor Hannah now to come and uh, recognize uh, some other special guests who are here with us this morning. Again, good morning. Uh, we have some, you would notice that we have this crew in the middle here. It's filled up uh, some faces that we don't normally see with us. And would they represent, as I call your groups, just stand so that they can see who's identified with those particular groups. I'm going to start with our... Uh, the Georgia School of Dance Theater out of Grand Bahama. Please be seated. Then we have the Chai Down, the Chai Down Tumblers. Please stand. Chai Down Tumblers. Now, where y'all think they from? They're from Chicago, all the way from Chicago. Please be seated. Welcome to the Bahamas. And then we have the Bahamas Dance Theater. Please be seated. Now I ask the directors, 
present of all of those schools. So please come and stand here with me for a second. From the Chai Town Tumblers and from George's School of Dance and from the Bombers Dance Theater. We're the Chai Town people, directors. Send a representative. <laughs> now we normally don't go through such an extensive welcome, but I'm doing this for two reasons. Number one, I'm personally associated with uh, the Bahamas Dance Theater. I'm a director of the Bahamas Dance Theater, soon not to be a director, Shelley, and because I just have too much work and I've been telling you all for years now, you all have to find a replacement for me. They represent hundreds of young people. And as a director of the Bahamas Dance Theater, I've always made my position very clear. And I thank God that in the Bahamas Dance Theater, and I know Georgia and Grand Bahama, who came out of Bahamas Dance Theater, these ladies stand for Christian principles in the running of a cultural institution. And that is very important. So in a minute, I'm gonna say a prayer for them because I wanna say in the face of everything that is around you, telling you that we are to submit to the culture around us as opposed to influencing the culture around us. I want to say to you, hold strong to what I've taught you and what not only I, but for what you know, your mentor, the common mentor in this group, the Chicago group, the Grand Bahama group, and the Nassau group, is a lady who's passed on, but who passed on some very strong values as to how dancers and performers ought to conduct themselves, and that is Shirley Hall Bass. Shirley Hall Bass came here from Chicago many years ago. And when she looked around, she saw a tremendous talent, but nobody training the talent. And so she provided a school so that people who didn't have a whole lot of money, but who had a whole lot of talent, could be trained in the theatrical arts. And I am a beneficiary of that training. And so, you enjoy so many moments when you see our dance team come here. And our sister Stephanie is one of the senior students of Shirley Hall Bass. And she's a beneficiary of that training. Because these are our national focus months, I just want us to remember the people who contribute to our development and you're touched by it and you don't even know how you're being touched by it. And that is why I call you out for special notice. But I want to pray for you now. By the way, one other benefit of this is our elder, Michael Hanna, got his wife out of the Bahamas Dance Theater, so. <laughs> And that literally happened in the Bahamas dance theater practice. That's when she saw a sergeant and determined, yeah, I gotta have him. And that's exactly how it go. Well, listen, I'm gonna pray for you ladies, please. You remember what I told you. Do not drop the standard. Do not drop the standard. Be the organization that say we will go in the face of everything, but we will provide entertainment that the whole family could come to and nobody have to blush. You, you got me? Don't ever let me see Georgia School of Dance or the Bahamas Dance Theater on TV and doing some stuff that I got to say. Now, how did my name ever get associated with that? You all understand me? But I thank God for your testimonies. 
And if your testimonies are what you say it is, I know it will not go badly. So just join me in prayer for these dance for the school father. First, we just want to remember Shirley Hall Bass and what she brought to the Bahamas and for her commitment to Bahamian children. She didn't have to do it. We believe you sent us here. You sent her here to train us and we thank you for it. Father, we pray that as the school continues, you know, they're facing many difficulties that Father, first we pray for just unity in the school, for harmonious working relationship among the directors and the leaders to continue to build something that was started from someone who came from far away to get it done. Now, Father, these ladies standing here represent the leadership of hundreds of souls. Lord, may they always do the things that build true Christian character, that they show that the arts could be something that is God glorifying. And Father, we pray that you give them the wisdom and the resolve that at the end of their work and what they're doing, you could say to them, you've done a good job. You've represented me. And so, Father, I ask you to keep all of these young people safe. Keep them from harm, from danger, from bad decisions. Father, I commit each director, each child to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Bye-bye, guys. Thank you. God bless you. Ah, Georgia. Georgia, my man. Okay. Right now, there's another prayer moment we have. I would like to ask uh, Sister Jewel and the complete short-term missions team to please quickly come and assemble down here. And Sister Jewel is just going to give us a synopsis of what they're going to be doing over the next couple of weeks in Haiti. Um, uh, please, team, everybody that's going on short-term missions, please assemble down here. And Sister Jewel is just going to give us a quick update on all that you're going to be doing. Again, we invite the team to come as quickly as you can so we can uh, pray for you as well. Uh, just a quick announcement for the person who's driving the vehicle 7571, Angela Mitchell. It's a white Jeep. Uh, we need you to uh, go and adjust your vehicle. Uh, so if you can assist us on the outside, I'd be appreciative. Good morning, church. We have... Uh, elders, I want every available elder to please come forward also. We want to lay hands on these people as we commission them to go. Okay, again, good morning. We have 21 persons who are gearing up and getting ready to leave Saturday morning, early in the morning, to begin our journey to Jack Mel, Haiti. Jack Mel, Haiti is four hours drive southeast of Port-au-Prince. This is our first time going to Jack Mel, Haiti, um, and our first time working with the mission organization called Dao Mao, if I said it properly, Christian Mission. Um, they have a school that goes from preschool to high school, and they have 850 plus students. They have a baby, fe baby feeding program. They also have an orphanage. But due to the hurricane, they've had a lot of kids that became orphans, and I'm sorry, not the hurricane, the earthquake. So they need to um, build a new orphanage, and that's the construction project that we're gonna be working on. We also will be assisting with Vacation Bible School and with any other little thing that needs to be done on the compound. <clears throat> Some persons are missing this morning. We have also going with our Pastor Lyle, who's at Calvary Bible Church ministering this morning. We have Jerry Mark, I don't see him. Um, Raymond Hutchison, Charlotte Smith, Tina Kelly, Marianne Wilson, Shanae Wilson, Jennifer Pete, Gabrielle Neely, Lisa and De Ashley Adley, um, Allison and Raven Kelly, um, Brazil Beijing Rogers, Bajer Rogers, who's joining us later, Autumn and August Dickens, who'll join us later, Stanis, Mortimer, and myself. So that's the 21 persons. Um, our prayer request would be, number one, for safe travel. As a team leader, I do not take for granted for one minute that over the past 23 years, God's grace and mercy has been extended to us time and time over again, where everyone in the team has returned healthy, 
and alive. So we give God thanks for that. So we want to ask you to continue to pray for that as we travel by plane, as we travel by bus, and our vacation Bible school three mornings is an hour drive from where we're living, and two mornings is a 45 minute drive, so we'll be driving quite a bit. So we pray for that. We also pray that um, our team would truly be a source of encouragement to the missionaries there, and also they'd really sense the presence of God in our lives, and that any way that God wants to use us to minister to the Haitian people and to the mission itself, that we'd make ourselves available. And personally, for each team member, pray that God, that as God speaks to us while we do this um, mission, that we'd listen to where he wants to direct us personally in our spiritual walk. Um, so we are excited. Um, we have some packing to do. So if you want to give any calls and maybe place a dollar in somebody's hand, that's about 10 Haitian dollars. Um, that'll go a long way. Thank you. Thank you, Jewel. And so we're going to call now the elders to just uh, divide yourselves among this group, lay your hands on them. The rest of you, we are going to call on one of the elders of outreach, Elder Michael Hanna, who will lead the prayer uh, for this group as we send them away. I just want to reiterate, you may not be able to go, but if you have a spare 10, 20, 100, lying around, place it in the hands of one of these people or in the leader, uh, they certainly can use it. Uh, Elder Michael Hanna, Good morning still. <clears throat> Let's pray. Bow our heads, close your eyes as we pray for this team. Father, we commit this team to you, first of all, Lord, for the willingness to do this work to do this to go on this mission trip lord we thank you for them and their willingness to do that lord we pray that if there are any funding issues still remaining outstanding lord we pray that you will bless and bring together the funds that are needed lord we also pray for safe travel by plane by bus we pray that the luggage and the supplies that are going with them will get there safely we pray for the health concerns lord that no one will fall ill that there won't be any um, adverse effects to any food issues or any environmental issues lord we pray that you will cover them and protect them and then lord we pray for the ministry opportunities the the building of of lives as well as the building project that is before them Lord, we commend them to you for safekeeping, and we, we ask that you go with them as they represent us, the body of Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. I'm sorry, I forgot one aspect of our ministry that's going to take place. One of our team members, Beijing Rogers, um, she has a little organization called It's Our Turn IOT, which encourages young people that you don't have to wait until you get old to live out your potential and that God can use you. And so what she's done is she's, out of allowance, purchased backpacks for all the kids in the orphanages <clears throat> along with school supplies. She's gonna have a little party for them. It's basically to encourage them, let them know that they're special, that no matter the situation they find themselves and they may not have much, that God is there with them and he created them. So you could pray for that little project also that's gonna be a part of it. Okay, Tina wants me to remind that um, there's a lunch at my house right afterwards for the team when you get your final information and all your um, customs and immigration forms. Thanks. Uh, Brother Adam, I know we are supposed to be on a new verse today. And this is the, the verse from last week. So are we going to suspend today and... Uh, do the new pick up the new verse next week, or you want to come and just ensure that they remembered what they were supposed to have remembered from last week? Let's welcome Brother Adam as he comes. All right, Grace. It took too long. I was going to skip my section. Now, everybody who's on the edge of a row, please stand up. 
It's a very big responsibility. Outer edge and inner edge. Including Dexter in the front. All right. If you're on the outside of your road, look on the inside. Y'all looking? That means y'all are my spies. <laughs> if you see anybody cheating, you go, ah, 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 ah. ah. And I want to hear it. The, it is not going up on the board. This is our end of month exam. I feel the unrest. Matthew 28, 18, and 20. All right, we're going to start over and I'm going to help you all out. Then Jesus came to them and said, All right, everyone who didn't cheat, raise your hand. All of y'all who lying, put your hands back down. All right, we're going to do it once with the board. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Then, okay, if it's not, all right, it's up. Then Jesus came to them and said, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always, to the very ends of the age. And there's only one condition all of that is on, and that's in our next verse. It's Romans 10, 9, and 10. Who knows Romans 10, 9, and 10? When the board's off and the bulletins are down. All right, we're gonna keep it on the board. This is our one for the next month. And when August is over, I'm gonna expect everyone to know this verse. R Romans 10, nine and 10. If you confess to your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. To all of you who sat down before I said, you sit down, y'all are fired. Y'all are no longer allowed to sit on the edge. All right, see y'all next week. Thank you, Brother Adam. We have a couple of announcements that we just want to bring into your hearing this morning. You guys believe it's already July? Half of the year is almost gone. Wow. Almost time to half and gone. What the sick. What the sick. Almost time to celebrate Christmas again. Wow. Winter in the Bahamas. A couple of announcements we want to bring into your hearing just as a reminder. Um, you do see it in your bulletin, in your programs where uh, the youth lock-in will occur on August 5th, so uh, the details are in there, minded for those uh, young persons who are between the ages of 14 and 18, and uh, you can consult um, some of the members of King's Court, Brittany Camp and uh, Brian Clark, to assist you with more details. Want to also, the men's fishing trip, we've been trying to put this fishing trip on for a little while, and uh, it's been past uh, the men's month. So we are planning the men's fishing trip for Easter Monday. Not Easter Monday. August Monday. For those of you who come on Easter Monday, you can miss it. <laughs> so August Monday, August Monday, we're planning the, the men's fishing trip. Those of you men who are interested, please remain behind just for a few moments uh, so we can get some details and uh, also pass the information on so we can uh, get all the names, get all the necessary boats uh, prepared. Uh, immediately thereafter, 
we'll be cooking what we catch. All right? So, want to make sure you don't get, you don't catch, you don't eat. <laughs> so, we want to invite all the men to that. Uh, congratulations goes out to Antonio and Candace. They had a baby girl this week, eight pounds on, on change. So, congratulations to them. And we also have a special congratulations also going out to David Jasmine Hanna, who graduated with his law degree from Manchester University, England, two weeks ago. There he is. Congratulations to you, David. Job well done. Excellent, excellent. In your programs, we also want to remind you throughout the course of the week, you do have listed a number of persons there for special prayer requests. Um, those persons who may be ailing among us, I just got information that Marina Evans um, was admitted to hospital, uh, female med medical one at the Princess Margaret Hospital, so please add her to your listing. And if you have an opportunity, please visit those who may be in hospital or give those who are sick a phone call. We have a number of persons today who are celebrating their birthday. Uh, celebrating, sorry, this week. Uh, celebrating their birthdays and we want to just say a special hello to them and remind you to give them a call on the 29th uh, Dana Morrison on the 27th Jason Knowles and, and Alexandria Moss on the 26th Dwight Bain, Tremaine Strong, Jasmine Henfield, Andrew Pinling and on the 25th Ivan Loshan and Jade Stubbs will be celebrating birthday so a uh, special happy birthday is extended to those folks we also want to recognize those persons who are celebrating anniversaries, and um, especially on July 30th, we have Lyndon and Jessica Russell, and then also uh, Minister Hubert Minnis, Minister of Health, and his lovely wife Patricia will be celebrating also today their special anniversary. And now I have a story for you. I said to you that I will not wear a suit anymore for the rest of the summer but as you can clearly see I'm in a suit I am portraying the colors of a wonderful day in history when God opened up the skies and, and brought two persons together I want to show you a couple of photos very very quickly I have the liberty of doing this because I'm the worship leader as you can see there was an innocent quiet reserved young man right there bearing a ring because he had a conversation with a young lady who he dared to say will complete him. In the next photo, we have a lady who, very aggressive, knew what she wanted, bent out, and got it. She would not take no for an answer. That quiet reserve young man had no choice but to say, yes, I do. And on our final photo, on the 24th, they became one. So a special happy anniversary is extended to my lovely wife, Rochelle. With 18 years, I could think of no other man you should be married to. Happy anniversary, honey. I love you. Don't worry, the Lord was blessed in that just a while ago as well. No? Didn't deviate too much. And now we're going to honor the Lord with our giving. <laughs> Shall we stand as I invite our ushers to come? Sorry, sorry, Brother Charles, I know you wrote this, right? You wrote this song, son. Happy birthday, Jingle! To all those persons who celebrated happy birthday, the ushers is coming, we're going to sing a happy birthday to those pers persons. Happy anniversary to those persons celebrating today and throughout the course of this week. Happy birthday, 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 happy bir
thank God for giving us the opportunity to be able to give our offering today. And um, I'm especially um, convicted by the, the, the work of the project to go and give out the backpacks and so forth. I think that's a tremendous project. Um, I know, having been on the ground in Haiti, some of the things going on there. So there's a lot among us who don't have the opportunity to give. But for those of us this morning who do have the opportunity to give, we want to give it unto the Lord to his good his work and that he may receive the honor. Shall we pray for the offering this morning? In the name of Jesus, we come before you, our Lord and Savior, to thank you for your wonderful blessings to us, your children. Father, we thank you for the many provisions you give us as your children. We thank you, first of all, for the provision of liberty that we can proclaim um, to the highest of the hills uh, that you are Lord and Savior. We thank you, O oh God, for the opportunity now to give back unto you. We pray, O oh God, that the offering uh, will be used mightily for your work. We pray, O oh God, for those who may not have the ability at this point in time to give. We pray for their situations, that their situations may improve. And so we pray, O oh God, for those who are in need, that you provide the need wherever they are. Uh, Father, we ask your blessing on this offering. In Jesus' name, we give you thanks. Amen. All right. Is that Beijing with the project for the backpack? Beijing, is that your project? Uh, yeah. All right. I'm going to donate 30 backpacks towards your project. So please see me after church so we can talk about that. And again, those of you who can assist with the many projects, let's go ahead and see how we can help uh, with the thing, what we're doing in the mission field in Haiti. Senior Pastor Lau Bethel, as you heard, is ministering at Calvary Bible today, and uh, we're extremely pleased to have in his stead uh, another servant of the Lord to come and minister to us this, this morning. And so I'm going to invite uh, Pastor Hannah to come and introduce our speaker this morning. Our speaker this morning is no stranger to us, but you may not understand all of his credentials. He is truly, eminently qualified to speak to us. As a graduate of the distinguished Columbia Bible School, where he has obtained Masters of Divinity, Masters of Bible Education. Rudy is just an outstanding man among us. 
Rudy is the kind of man who exhibits the kind of Christian behavior. Not only, the way I should put it, is he's the kind of man who exhibits consistent Christian behavior. He's a man who in the worst, they say if you really want to know what a man is like, turn up the heat under him and see how he responds. But I've seen Rudy under excruciating heat. And the only thing that came out was the love of Jesus Christ and respect for his fellow man under the most excruciating circumstances. Whenever you see Rudy, and I think you could testify to this, have you ever seen Rudy when you thought Rudy had a problem? Always smiling, always glad to see you, always want to know how he could help you but i am sure rudy has problems like all of us but you'd never know it <laughs> you'd never know it and so in the absence of pastor lyle who is as you know pastor alan lee has not been well and of course we have to reach out to each other in these times and he's reaching out to our brothers and sisters at Calvary by filling their pulpit this morning. And Brother Rudy has graciously agreed to come and to bring us a word on a very important subject, the holiness of God. And I want us to really make this brother feel welcome as he comes to address us this morning. Thank you. Brother Rudolph would like for us to have this song before he gives the word. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. See God today? 
But before I get to that, my wife and I would not be here next Sunday and uh, needed a following. And I think it's fitting. But as Ely showed his glamorous wife and himself. So I just want to let you know, all of you know, that my wife and I will be celebrating 37 years of marriage on August the 10th. And let me tell you, you might think what you may, and you have that right in that church, but I believe that God couldn't give me another woman to sharpen me. I'm telling you, because I have a policy in my life as a Christian. Every circumstance that comes in my life, I ask God one question. God, what are you trying to tell me? And that's why I am who I am today. Because of my wife and the grace of God in her life and mine. And we can look forward by his grace to have been together for 37 years. And we look forward to the many more he'll give us by his grace. I'd like to read one portion of scripture. I was going to read another one, but due to time, because I plan to present a message today that took me five months to present in my adult class. Five months times four is 20 weeks, 15 Sundays. So I guess it'll be until seven o'clock. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. I will read this passage, and as I begin my message and as I go through it, there will be a reference to this. But as I have been taught on the old school of theology, at Columbia International University, I was taught one thing by Dr. Buck Hatch. He says, when you preach, let people know that you're presenting the Word of God. So I was never taught to use plenty of illustrations and tell jokes and all kinds of directions that you end up missing the truth of the Word of God. So forgive me if I don't be illustrative in my message. In a way that you might want me to, like some other flamboyant preacher, of which I am not. Because God did not, te did not bring me up by His grace in that way. I told somebody yesterday in my workplace, I think your problem is, that you're spending too much time looking at the messenger, that you end up missing the message. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, I should have worn my glasses, my reading glasses. I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were selves, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they did fly. And they were calling to one another. The angels themselves are calling to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Let's pray. Father, today we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. 
And Father, by your Holy Spirit, I ask that you would open our eyes, that we might just get a glimpse of who you really are. As we are exposed to the truth of your word, in a space with some statements and phrases that seeks to help us to better understand what you're saying to us. Teach us today, open our eyes today, that we may see you as we want. In Christ's name, amen. When Cale Bahamas went digital and informed all consumers that they would have to get new digital boxes, I had mine put in as well. So they called, we made an appointment, and they showed up. They installed the new digital boxes. I told my wife and I and my daughter that everything is fine. So we thought it was fine. So we turned our own on later on, our TV, and sure enough, the box in our room seemed to be working fine. A few minutes later, my daughter called and said, Mommy, your TV on? He said, yes, yeah. mine ain't working. What do you mean it ain't working? That's a new digital box. So I told my wife, you better call Gail Bahamas. And so she did. And the lady on the other end was saying, well, it should be working. It's supposed to be working. It's a new digital box. So that went on for a little while and looked like the woman couldn't get the message on the other end about the boxes ain't working. So I said, give me the phone. I said, hello? My name is Mr. William Rudolph Cartwright. Don't you understand plain English? The box is not working. Please send a technician. All right, we will. So they did. And sure enough, when the technician arrived, guess what? It was a defective box. You know, we as individuals are like that. We're just like that defective digital box. Sin has so corrupted us that it's impossible for us to tune in to the holiness of God. It just cannot pick him up. Dr. Tony Evans puts it this way, which I like his, the way he puts this. Since Adam's fall, our ability to pick up the God channel has been greatly disturbed. As a result, we stay in the, into the picture of the Holy Other, our great God. But somehow, he just does not come into clear focus. Even after you and I are saved, joining into God can be quite a difficult exercise because it is, he is unlike anyone that you and I will ever come into a relationship with or even contact with in our life. The song we sang says, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, though the darkness hide thee, though the Hey, eye of sinful man, thy glory may not see. Only thou art holy. There is none beside thee, perfect in love and power and purity. I want to let you know that of all the things that is very hard and difficult for us to focus on, is truly God's holiness. And so this is what I want to share with you today, even though it is one of the most uncomfortable arguments of God to deal with because it reminds us so much unlike God we are. And I can tell you, 
You ever felt uh, my eyes have been running water now for days? I this morning I got it. You almost, you know, it's almost feel like you're, you're shaking, right? Because this week my wife would ask me why I can't go to sleep. I didn't tell her. You lay in your bed and you're thinking and your mind is running. And then you fall asleep. I remember I had a night this week that I ain't sure whether I was dreaming or whether I was just thinking. And like someone said to me, you want to see God? Come and see him. And guess what? I woke. Because I'm thinking so much about the holiness of God and what he's like. So I'd like to start with a definition that helps us to understand the holiness of God. The holiness of God is his intrinsic, now that's a little, not a big, a little big word, I right, let me in a second, and transcendental purity. The standard of righteousness to which the whole universe must conform. The word in, intrinsic or transcendental has the idea that there is nobody else like him nowhere to be found. So don't even try to look. God does not conform to any standard created by others because he is the standard. To put it another way, you can call evil evil only if there's a God against whose standard you and I can measure evil. Bad can only be bad if there is an absolute standard which says it is bad. And that absolute standard is God. So I want to share with you five things about this great but yet sobering attribute of God. And I call this one is God's central attribute. In Exodus 15, 11, in this chapter of Exodus, Moses recites the great deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Egyptians and says in verse 11, O Lord, who is like thee, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders. If you want to understand the majesty, the uniqueness, and the distinctiveness of God, you have to understand it combined with his holiness. You see, our problem is we want to understand God, but please, I do not want to deal with his holiness. You will have a myopia. If you try to understand God apart from his holiness, it is the key to God's nature. I submit to you today that God's holiness opens the door to making sense out of everything else about him. God's love is holy love. God's omniscience is holy omniscience. God's omnipotence is holy omnipotence. His omnipresence is holy omnipresence. Everything about God has been infiltrated by the defining attribute of God called holiness. God even calls himself by that name. Throughout the Old and New Testament, he is called the Holy One. When Mary was receiving her prayer, was reciting her praise to God at the news that she would give birth to the Savior, Jesus Christ. She said in Luke 1 49, the mighty one has done great things for me and the holy is his name. God's holiness is central to understanding who he is. And as we saw in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 3, the prophet says, holy, holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. This, in the, in the Hebrew language, when a word is repeated three times, it is repeated for emphatic or emphasis. 
And it means that you and I must take note of what's being said. It's not just words. It's a tremendous truth that God wants to, us to get a hold of. And God wants us not to miss what he's saying to us. At the heart of who God is, is his holiness. God swears by his holiness. Psalm 89, 35. And the question must be asked, why? Because it is the fullest expression of his character and fully explains who he is. The Bible declares that God's law is holy, Romans 7, 12, because God is holy. God is holy in all his being, Leviticus 19, verse 2. Therefore, holiness is the defining point, the heart of the matter of who God is. Secondly, God's holiness separates him from creation. The prophet Isaiah writes, For thus says the high and exalted one, who lives forever, whose name is holy, I dwell on a high and a holy place. And also with the contrite and lowly in spirit. In order to revive the spirit of the lowly and revive the heart of the contrite. Tremendity, I could, I could bring a whole message just in that voice. For us to understand. God is saying to us, look. You've got to come to grips with who I am in my holiness. The Hebrew word holy means separate. Separate and apart from. It is the same root word from which we get the word saint and sanctified. All three of these words carry the meaning to be separate or very distinct. Because he is so high in where he dwells, and according to who he is, we must bow low. One of the saddest, one of the tragedies of our generation, especially in democratic countries, I mean, all of the websites I go and read, I mean, people's idea about God. It's like God is just like one of us. We play with God like we play with a toy. I'm serious. In my workplace, I hear, I even hear some professors by some pastors. It's like, I put it this way. We treat God as though he's some grandfather with some long gray beard that we can manipulate That he just follows through and do our bidding. Perfect in holiness. This is why God told Moses in the burning bush. Remove your sandals from your feet. For the place on which you, you are standing is holy ground. Is holy ground. Exodus 3, 5. The spot where the bush seems to be burning... It's not just fire. It is the obvious realization that the holiness of God is so pure and bright that it looks like there's fire in the tree. The Bible tells us, but the tree is not consumed. When you come to understand how high and holy God is, you will come to understand how little we are. See, it's, we like to have this Mr. Big Stuff attitude or this one-upmanship attitude that reveals a total misconception of who we really are. And more than that, a terrible misconception of who God is. Romans 10, 3 lets us know that people are ignorant of the holiness of God. 
They don't understand that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. First John 1 5. James 1 13 14 lets us know that God cannot sin. He cannot even be tempted to sin. And he cannot tempt someone else to sin. Yes, my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and friends who are visiting us with us, with us today, the very idea of sin being in God or coming from God is inconceivable because of his holiness. And so this is where we really get confused. Because we like to, we as human beings, we like to create sins. I might boy some in the bubbles today. Somebody's here I'm going to share next. Because what I'm going to compare you to, you might even tune me out. But I don't want you to tune me out, because when you do, but don't you ever tune God out? We like to create sins and put them in categories of awfulness. We like to say, he's a bad sinner. Because he's a murderer or a rapist. And so that brings me to my next, I call it a sub point and then my main point here. With God, there are no degrees of sin. You what I just said? Right now, of all these people in this room, when God looks down at us, we are on the same level ground playing field. I don't care what school you've been to, how much degrees and letters you have behind your name, what position you have, when God looks down, we are the same. And some of us, our thinking can be changed in that direction. That's why we put ourselves on pedestals. And we think we are better than others. And God says, you are not. We are just like the Pharisee that Jesus gives them the story when he went to the temple. And when the Pharisee got in the temple, he's standing. And he says in his prayer, Father, I thank you that I am not like that tax collector. Because I don't do the sins that he's doing. And the tax collector is standing away from the Pharisee. We know the, the tax collector said, he didn't even bother to lift his head up. He just looked down and he beat on his breast and he said one simple phrase, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. See, we are good at grading sins, but never catch the awfulness of the sin, even of what we are grading. We even say, well, you know, he's an okay sinner. He's not like that bad sinner. Then we go a little further and come to what we call the good sinner. He's a nice guy. He's not perfect, but he's a nice guy. He's cool, man. He's cool. Finally, we come to the excellent sinner, I call it. And as a matter of fact, this is the character that we all think we're in. We might even say, yes, well, you know, I'm not perfect, but Lord have mercy. I'm good. I am not like the others. We make these kind of comparisons when it comes to sin, but God does not make or recognize such measurements. God has no degrees of sin, but there are degrees of consequences. The man in maximum security at a large, at a large prison Fox Hill. I go there from time to time. And I preach to them. 
is no different in the sight of God, a holy God, than the person who goes through all of his or her life and only tells one lie. This is why this is why I start to shake. Honestly, I, I my uh, my hand is is this move. I, you know, it's like you can't keep still, right? Because when you come to begin to get a glimpse of when, it, because God is a holy God, right? We have to stop this greedy and measuring. It's like when I went to college. You know, my first year of college, my first semester of college, I was put on a. I don't know if you even know about this. I, mean, I don't know if you have anybody else in this here, any new students. You know, I didn't when I went to college at CIU, Columbia International University. I didn't know they had a scored grading system. I didn't really understand how the system really works. So at the end of the first semester, I was put on probation. <laughs> <coughs> Honestly, so you all can tell me about probation. I've been there. I thought the culture today. They said, yeah, I know, I know. So that's why I told you before we went, make sure you understand how they grade. So I spent the next semester and the next semester trying to raise my average up. So I can get off probation. You see, they have what they call a curve. But God don't have a curve when it's come to sin. So those below the curve, you fail. And those above the curve, you make it. No, it don't work that. God is not in the curving business. <laughs> now this really, now, now, now that really ticks us off. Because God put me in the same category as the murderer, the adulterer, the fornicator, the liar. Yes, he does. So don't you walk around with this high and mighty attitude. You know who I am? Look who I am. No. Oh. Romans 10, 3 says, sorry, 3, 10 says, there is none righteous, no, not even one. Romans 3, 23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You miss God's standard. Yes, there are differences in the consequences of sin, but there's no difference in the essence of sin. And bring me next to what I call meeting God face to face. When the prophet Habakkuk ran into the holiness of God, he said, My inward parts trembled. My lips quivered. Decay entered my bones. Chapter 3, verse 16. He had a different view about God. The word tremble had the idea of shaking with violent emotion, and the word quiver had the idea of vibrating and rattling together. So the word one is struck with extreme fear or cold. And you cannot stop your lips or body from shaking or trembling, no matter how much you try. I met my wife and I went to Pittsburgh with my brother Peter. And my wife never been in the snow, never been in the cold. Man. And you know, we got dressed in a boy, I didn't expect snow. But the snow came down overnight and it was extremely cold. You know, we all put on our jackets. Mine we had on on the shirts and a shirt on top of shirt and a jacket on top of jacket. And we went outside. And my wife, we went outside. And you know, when my wife went outside, her two lips, her, her mouth, I do that. I said, Why you can't stop? I said, Stop it, stop it, stop it. I can't stop it. <laughs> well, what I'm saying is, that's just like when you come face to face with the holiness of God, you start trembling, you start shaking, and you start, you can't stop. That's what it is to, to tremble, to quiver. When Job encountered the holiness of God, he cried out, Behold, I am insignificant. insignificant. I lay my hand over my mouth. Job 40 verse 4. I repent in dust and ashes. Job 42 verse 6. Although God had said, previously in Job chapter 2 verse 3, that Job was blameless and upright. A man who fears God and shuns evil. But when Job experienced the holiness of God, you know he said, I don't even think I'm the man that God thinks I am. Because he came to grips with the holiness of God. 
When you see God in the awesomeness of his holiness, you repent and become speechless. No matter what you think you are, or how good you think you are. Job also said, my ears had heard of you, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. We have to see God in his holiness. Else we will not make any sense of our Christian living. We have to stop looking at people who are bringing this grace in the name of God and Christ and using this as an excuse for not bowing to the holiness of God and submitting yourself in obedience to God. The reason that some of you right now are not believing in Christ because you are people, sorry, you see people are not the holiness of God. When you keep looking at people, you will never experience the holiness of God. Because they are not God. You and I have to come to grips with God, not people. When you stand in the presence of God, God is going to judge you by people. I tell my children, I told them before, when you stand before God, God is not going to ask you, did you meet the standard of your father? God says, did you meet my standard? You will have to deal with God now or later. For life, for he will have the last word. And you will submit to his holiness one way or the other. You cannot and will not escape the demands of a holy God. When I as I beheld God's holiness, he could only say, Woe is me, the great prophet, and this is all he could say. But he then said something else that really grabbed my attention. This is why I like to study language and words. So I went and I looked up these words. The word in the, in the King James and others says, I am undone or I am ruined. It's still not to tell you what's really here Jesus is experiencing. The word had the idea of coming apart or to be destroyed or silenced completely. Isaiah is saying, I have become unraveled. I am falling to pieces. I am coming apart. Why? Because I have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He saw God in the awesomeness of his holiness. When you and I come face to face with God, he corrects our own opinion of who we think we are. You and I discover that we are not what we thought we were when you really see God. And so therefore, you and I have to take living the Christian life seriously enough until we know and see God for who he is in his holiness. You see, God has to correct us sometimes. It's like a parent and a child. Sometimes we have to correct children because sometimes children think they are the parent and the parent is the child. And so the parent doesn't know who the child is and correct them. I tell a parent that the other day. You know, I, I watch these TV some programs sometimes. You ever watch the Super Nanny? I can't watch that crazy, foolish program. I don't see the food like that in my life. I told my wife, look, please change that channel. Because it gets under my skin. I want to like I get it. I got to slap them up. Right? <laughs> Asking a child if you want this, you want that. It's time out now. Let's have a time out. You know, time out, it's a SCOP. <laughs> I did my son last night, my two grandson. They was Tyler, Kaylin, and dying, dying in my house. I told him at 925, that is a softball. And softball, you play with that outside. Back to my ear here, boom, boom, boom. I go on there. 
I said, what did I tell you all? Boy, when I said what I tell you all, I mean, I they packed it real quick. You have to remind children where the standard is and who bears the standard. If you will become the child and the child will become the parent and you'll be frustrated for the rest of your life in the old age and wish you were dead. <laughs> If we are going to be serious about walking with God, we have to understand who He is and who we are in light of Him. We must stay low because He is high. We must hallow His name. We must worship Him seriously. We must stop playing church and stop playing Christianity. Most people hurry to get to work on time because they do not want to upset the boss. But come to church. And as long as they get there before they get benediction, they say, I'm on time. My brothers and sisters and friends, when God sees us treating our bosses better than we treat him, he says, you do not know who I am. I am the Holy One. I got to move quickly. God's holiness and sin. I'm going to condense it a little bit at this point so that I don't keep it too much longer. God's judgment is natural and necessary. Now people think that God's judgment is because he gets angry. Well, brothers and sisters, if God really got angry, you and I wouldn't be here. I'm serious. If God had outbursts of anger because of his holiness and because of sin by you and I, we would be obliterated. But God's judgment is natural and necessary. God judges sin because he cannot skip over sin. He cannot turn a blind eye because of his holy nature. Therefore his holiness dictates that he judges sin. God's, sin is all, God's judgment is also comprehensive. God has already judged Satan. And I want you all to get this. Because what I'm going to say next, this caused some struggles for us. Because we act as though he hadn't been judged yet. And that's why some of us are living in the sin that we're living in. We give, him, we give Satan too much credit. We give him too much power. He's a defeated fool. God had already judged Satan at the cross when Jesus died on the cross. And the day will come when he will judge Satan in the future as well as all mankind. In Matthew 25, 41, Jesus says, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. You see, God did not create the lake of fire for people. He created the lake of fire and eternal damnation in the lake of fire for Satan and his angels. He created it for them. But you know, all those who choose to follow Satan will join him in the lake of fire. And if you choose to go that route, then you'll end up in the same place with Satan and his angels. And you cannot blame God. And I'll tell you later on why. You see, God is so holy that he judges his own son. Because of his holiness. Men crucified Jesus by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Acts 2.23 God's holiness is so terrible. It is terrible in the Old Testament and it's terrible in the New Testament. The Bible says in Hebrews 12.29 Our God is a consuming fire. He cannot be trifled with because he's a holy God. Just think of it. For one sin Adam and Eve were banned from the Garden of Eden. For one sin, Cain 
and his descendants was cursed forever. For one sin, Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land. God said, speak to the rock, and he only struck the rock. And God said, you will not enter the promised land. For one sin. The servant of Elijah got the leprosy that Naaman had. For one sin, Ananias and Sapphira were led out of the room in Jerusalem dead. This is a God who is a consuming fire. God must always by nature have a judgment for sin. And although he judges sin, oh my friend, this is why I like to part. He still loves the sinner. And this is what I want you to get today. And even I have to end my message with this without covering the rest. I want you to get this. God loves the sinner. God does not wipe us all out because why he despises and judges sin, he is intensely I want everybody. He is intensely in love with the sinner. Romans 5 8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's holiness is directed against sin, but he loves the sinner. The problem is, he cannot overlook the sinner in judging the sin. Because the sinner is the one committing the sin. That makes sense to you? Yes, sir. yes, this business about God and His holiness is a very serious matter. And it should shake us in our shoes. When God came down at Mount Sinai to the children of Israel, the mountain shook violently. Exodus 19, 16 to 18. And He didn't even open His mouth to speak as yet. When God moves, mountains shake. When God moves, trees begin to talk. When God moves, even the waves might start walking. When God speaks and moves, the sea stands up like a wall with an open road in the center and just lets walk through the Red Sea on dry ground. Because God, when he shows up, he lets us know who he is. The question I ask this today is this. Why don't we quiver at the thought of God? Why do we hold him in awe? Why are we not reverential toward God? I believe the answer is because we have forgotten who he is. We do not, we do not see him for who he is. We think he is like the one of us. We have lost completely the reverential fear of God. We must take God more seriously. We have to see him in his holiness. But you know, God also in his holiness. We must come to grips with God's holiness on his terms. Pat Hannah shared with me, shared with you this morning in the breaking of bread service, communion. The only thing that can satisfy the demands of a holy God is the shedding of blood. Now I do not know why God chose this path. I can't answer that. The Bible does not give that answer. But I do know that there must be a covering and a payment for sin. And all I know is that this is what God says must happen. The beautiful thing in the Garden of Eden, when God, if I would ask you, who made the first sacrifice? Who killed the first animal for the first sacrifice? Huh? God did. God took that first animal and he killed it. And he used the skins to cover their bodies and the blood to cover their sin. God on that very moment says, it is a covering of the blood. God is showing us what this is about. And you and I must appreciate what God has done. I'm gonna move very quickly to understand this. And this is, this is, and this is, it is this. And this is what understand that God showed this up in the life of Israel. God gave them the tabernacle. And what happens in the tabernacle, there's a this tent-like structure. And this tent-like structure tabernacle had three curtains. The outside entrance had one curtain, which when you enter, you enter the court, where all people could come, except Gentiles. 
The next curtain went into the holy place. And the next curtain went into the holiest of all. But only the high priest could go in the holiest of all. Behind that curtain in the holiest of all. Or what we call the most holy place. And when he went, he had to have blood from the sacrifice of the altar that took place in the holy place section. Because if he ever entered the most holy place behind that curtain, the minute he stepped across, he would have been obliterated. And he would not be among the living anymore. That's why even the Israelites, it got so, they got so fearful as time went on that when they, by the time Jesus came, they were tying ropes on the legs of the high priest. So when he went, if he's if the sacrifice of the imperfect and the blood is not accepted, if he died, killed, he can put him back out. Because they went inside to take him out, they'd be dead too. As a matter of fact, in Israel's life, the average Jew in a given year could have off, had to offer at least 500 sacrifices of different kinds, of different animals, birds and doves, and you name it, to cover his sin. But praise God, that old tabernacle is done away with. That old tabernacle is no more. We have a new tabernacle, a new one. And who's the tabernacle? Jesus. You know, Hebrews is one of my favorite books. And I like Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. And I'm going to read these verses to you. Our tabernacle. For Christ did not enter a holy plate made with hands, he made a copy of the true one, but in the heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he should offer himself often at the high priest enters the holy place, year by year, with blood not his own. Then our writer goes on to say in verse 28, that Hebrews 9 28. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, shall appear the second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await for him. You see, because of Jesus, our new tabernacle, when Jesus took his sacrifice and took it, but he entered the holy place, the tabernacle of the heavens, in the presence of God, and was able to present not just the blood, but himself. And he is the living sacrifice. And so that now we and I, you and I can dance. We can even waltz. I don't know how it is. I never dance it, but I don't know that's one dance, you know. Right? We can gracefully and boldly enter the presence of God because of what Jesus has done. And so the condition for approaching God is a blood sacrifice. The blood of Jesus. And Jesus was that blood sacrifice for us. And this is where our God's holiness and our lifestyle. The holiness of God demands that Christians reflect his character in a way we live. The apostle Peter puts it this way in 1 Peter 1, 14 to 16. As your obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as you, he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. And so our lifestyle as Christians now is that we must live our lives to please our God. We must be pursuers of his righteousness, of his holiness, an active pursuit. One of these days I'm going to preach on the words and how the word pursue and the follow after is used. Pursue means, you know, it's not a stagnant, inactive, sitting down and hope everything goes well. I mean, you go after it. And you even fight against it and you persevere. You must add to your salvation the pursuit of holiness. Hebrews 12, 14 puts it this way. But we have these words from God. Make every effort to live in peace with all men. We get that most of the time, but we don't get the next phrase. Because we don't see the connection of pursue in relation to holiness. So I like to read it this way. 
Make every effort to live in peace with all men. Make every effort to be holy without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So it is the pursuit of peace and the pursuit of holiness. We all like to dwell just on peace and leave the pursuit of holiness alone. The idea there is the falling after, after, going after, or pursuing. And when we pursue holiness, we must call sin, sin. It is not just a crime, defects, mistakes, and infirmities, etc. And even when it appears that sin is owned up to, accused are made, and we still say, well, you know, I'm just human. When we do this, we do not know who God is. You cannot excuse sin, and you cannot keep saying, oh, everyone does it. No, you don't know God. I know who God is. We are to go after holiness as a goal in life. It's an active pursuit of living the way God wants us to live. Our lives have everything for us to live as though we... I'm sorry, let me put this way. Our lives have high spiritual value. But some of us live as though we are still in the pig's pen. I know that is. I used to mind pigs as a boy in Long Island. It's like you go and you have a nice house to stay in and you still go and sit among the pigs. God has given us a dynamic spiritual life to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes, the more our hearts are awed by His holiness, which is too wonderful to be described in words, the more acceptable our approaches to Him will be. You see, God does not ask us to be omnipotent. He does not ask us to be omniscient or all-powerful or all-knowing. But he asks us and tells us we must be holy in all manner of our living. We have to get clean. And we have to try to stay clean. And I'll give you one simple verse as I close. And that has to do with confession. First John 1 John 9 said, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. God can clean you up. God can clean you up. The question is, do you want to be clean? Do you want to be made righteous? And that's the question we ask. When Isaiah saw the holiness of God, and when God cleansed him, then God cleaned him up, cleansed him, fixed him up, and used him up. That's what happens when you see God in His holiness. So the question as it goes is this. Do you know who God is? If you are not a Christian, you must come to, to Christ because He is your tabernacle. He's your only way to God. In fact, the Bible says there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Acts 4.12 Jesus Christ is your mediator, your go-between, your tabernacle, your only way to God. You must express complete faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross when he sheds his blood for your sin. If you do this, you will trust the Lord Jesus Christ alone as your Savior. God will make you his child. If you are a Christian, your job, your goal is to keep short of sin accounts with God and to walk always warning to for God to clean you up. You know right now what is cleansing, what cleansing is needed in your life. Talk to God right now and ask him to forgive you of all the sin that has accumulated in your life so that he can forgive you, cleanse you, use you to his glory. Therefore, as God alone is our source and fountain of holiness, let us earnestly seek holiness from him. Let it be our daily prayer that God may sanctify us holy. And our whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. First Thessalonians 5.23 And this is the pursuit of every Christian from the leadership straight down. No one exempted. This ain't just for the leaders. It's for everyone. Every one of us always need cleansing. So sinner, you need cleansing. And come to grips with the fact that only Jesus Christ can cleanse you from your sin and give you eternal life. Christian, you must come to grips with the fact that Jesus Christ can cleanse you from your sin. Once you confess, God forgives, and you can move on. Get up. And live for God to his glory. Let's pray. Father, 
Thank you for your word today. Thank you that it is true. It is what you have revealed to us in the book we call the Bible. Oh God, I pray that for those who do not know Christ as Savior today, that they would come to grips with the fact that Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross, that they might know what it is to have their sins forgiven and to know what it is to have the promise of eternal life that only he provides. Father, for every Christian today, I pray that it will be... I just want to thank Brother Rural for challenging us with such a timely word. A word that reminds us that if we are to consider who God is at all, we have to start with the core of who and what he is, and he is holy. This is enough for us to chew on for the rest of the year. This is enough to challenge us to change. This is enough to motivate us to service. Even now, I ask you to go and serve the Lord. Father, bless us and keep us. Open our eyes to the many opportunities we have for ministry this week. For the many opportunities we have to touch a life. For the many opportunities to share our knowledge and our witness of you. Father, keep us, protect us in your love. Draw us closer to yourself. And Father, may you be blessed by what we do, what we say, and how we act in this week. In Jesus' name, amen.